Hi, I'm Tim. Welcome to Watchbox Reviews, and thank you for logging on. We're waking up with watches this weekend, and it is an incredible spread. Everything here is for sale. Names, references, and prices are in the description. For your questions about buying these or any watches you see here on Watchbox Reviews or my Instagram, tmasso at thewatchbox.com, the direct purchase and pricing inquiry line from you to me and my hand-picked crew for any of the watches you see here. Let's get started right out of the gate with something truly special. The DB25 Starry Sky from De Batoon of Lauberson, Switzerland. This is a watch produced by a company that builds only 150 watches a year. And as you can see, they build them differently. Note the constellations most prominently, Orion and his belt on the dial. The Starry Sky features a full flame blued titanium dial and hour track using a process patented by de Batoon back in 2002. So that's the first patent. We're going to keep track of these. 44.5 millimeters in white gold. The watch has impressive substance on the wrist without ever being onerous. You can see that the dial, a combination of hammered gold leaf, applique white gold cabochon stars, and modified hand-rolled skeleton breguet is all about the imagery and the effect as there is no branding on the dial. They don't even silk screen their name onto the underside of the crystal. The case band is unusual, but as you can see, adroit, handsome character lines, all of high polish. You can see that the lugs themselves are rather spare. This is not the DB28 line, so you're not going to see those floating lugs. This watch isn't like a spaceship for your wrist so much as it's simply a portion of space blazing on your wrist. Now you'll also note there is a moon phase, one half blued steel, one half white palladium. It has an adjustment interval of over 1,000 years and it is spherical, making it unique among moon phase displays in the industry. And that too is patented. Turn the watch over and you can see the entirety of the movement. Six day power reserve, manual wind, but all of it has been black polished. The highest standard of optical finish. It's something we're used to seeing on screws, on swan's neck regulators, on small components, but full mirror finish on the entire movement, including that lovely delta shaped barrel bridge is a spectacle, a sight to behold and unique to this brand. So you have those twin self adjusting barrel and the six day power reserve patented. You have the triple parachute shock protection system, shock protection spring, shock protection spring, and an Inca block at center for the balance staff. That is patented. The balance, which is a solid disc of silicon with a white gold rim, that is patented. Aerodynamic in profile to reduce aerodynamic parasitic losses. It also features all of its mass in the rim for a huge moment of inertia. There is a dog leg kinked flat hair spring that gives the same concentric beating properties as an overcoil. That is patented. And then finally, there is a silicon escape wheel for long intervals between overhauls, and that likewise is patented. Beautifully finished in the most traditional fashion, you'll notice that the timepiece fits easily, even though it's large. On my 16 centimeter circumference wrist, the lugs make this watch wear smaller, though a 45 for all practical intents and purposes, it wears more like a 42 on the wrist. And you can see it's not onerously thick. This is no Royal Oak Offshore. This is a watch that sits close coupled to the wrist, spectacular without being an exercise size in advertising on your wrist. You don't feel like you're wearing a brand. You're wearing an extension of your personality. The folks who know will ask and compliment. The folks who don't will leave it alone. But almost everyone is going to marvel at the sheer spectacle of that dial. A watch that draws attention for all the right reasons and a timepiece for the ages. That is the DB25 Story Sky. Now, I mentioned it's not a Royal Oak Offshore, but this is. Launched in 2010 in 100 pieces, this is the 42 millimeter titanium Audemars Piguet Royal Oak Offshore Pride of Argentina. AP's Royal Oak Offshore Pride of Argentina features applique satin finished rose gold numerals, rose gold chapter rings for the counters, and as you can see, a lovely deep blue mega tapisserie dial with a smooth hour track. So this is a little combination of the common hobnail with a smooth dial aesthetic rarely seen on the offshores. The watch in titanium wears easily in spite of its size because it's light in weight. In-house caliber internally, this 100 piece limited edition features the cabido on the back, which is effectively an early state house for Argentina in Buenos Aires. And it's a lot like the United States Independence Hall, an early seat of government and independence 
for Argentina, a patriotic symbol. The watch with a 50 to 55 hour power reserve and 100 meter water resistance is substantial. It features a matching titanium clasp. I'm going to close it on my wrist and you'll note that the 42 offshore wears more like a 44 or 45 millimeter watch. It is an impressive piece, all blues and golds and the silver flash of the titanium in satin and polish. A very special piece and a very important piece in the history of the offshore limited series. One of the best at 100 pieces made truly limited in the strictest sense. The movement also free sprung with a full balance bridge for shock resistance. Now jumping to a timepiece that needs no introduction because it can speak for itself, this is one of the core models at Jajera LeCoult, the Master Memovox, 40 millimeters in stainless steel. This version was launched at SIHH 2010. It features the caliber 956, which was the first of these Memovox calibers to include a quick set date. It's a wonderful all-arounder with a loomed dial, applique indices, and tri-arabics, and a very, very vocal alarm that has more of a sustain, a ring, and volume than a conventional alarm watch. I'm going to set this one up to fire, and you can judge for yourself. Now, it will ring longer than that, but I haven't set it up to occupy too much of our time. The watch, 40 millimeters on the wrist, is a nice tweener. It's neither oversized nor undersized. It's a full-sized modern watch with modern presence. It harks back to the great Memovox references of the 50s and the 60s. And the timepiece on my wrist is an easy watch to wear, a comfortable watch to wear, a versatile watch that will pair well with any attire. The combination of the silver dial and the silver metal versatile, if nothing else. This is a timepiece that represents the ultimate companion. Not just a watch that tells the time, but a watch that asserts the time. And again, a JLC manufacturer movement inside master 1,000 hours control. Outstanding precision. Those are timed to no worse than minus one second plus six seconds. But the watch on my wrist is better than that. This is a 2011 200 piece 43 millimeter platinum limited edition. This is the master grand tourbillon a timepiece that is part of the Master Grand Tradition series of ultra haute de gamme pieces from JLC. It is a tourbillon with a GMT and a pointer date, automatic winding. The watch uses the caliber 978 that in 2009 won the first chronometry trial to be held in Switzerland since 1976. And this movement put to the sword not just multiple chronometry specific movements pulled out of storage from the competing houses. This watch beat JLC's own gyro tourbillon too in the chronometry trial with a total annual deviation projected to be about 47 seconds a year with a mechanical watch. That is the potential accuracy of this movement. Now you can see it is not a thick watch in profile. We'll get close to the dial. This is one of JLC's exceptionally special ruthenium dials. You can see it's a lovely silver somewhere between gray and slate, but it has that metallic tinge and an explosive sunburst quality. It's a beautiful monotone that matches the white gold hands and indices as well as the platinum case. Now you can see the dial includes the tourbillon carriage, which is a one minute tourbillon, a hand finished tourbillon carriage, overcoil hairspring, free sprung, six position adjustment. You have this jump date complication, and I'm going to do my best to demonstrate that right now, see if I can drive it backwards, because the date complication is calculated to jump entirely over the tourbillon carriage in the jump from the 1st to the 31st. So you can see in the course of that one night, the date indicator will jump across the tourbillon so as not to obscure the tourbillon carriage and I'll get the minute hand out of the way. The tourbillon bridge is black polished. The carriage is made of titanium and entirely hand finished. It is very impressively executed and you can see how I'm able to set the local hour independently from the 24 hour subdial up at 12 o'clock. That is the GMT or second time zone in 24 hour format with both day and night guilloche patterns. Turn it all over, an impressive watch. You have a 22 carat winding mass, unidirectional, with ceramic bearings for high efficiency. You can see that there is 
competent and handsome finishing with Cote de Genève across the bridges and a combination of brushed and media blasted finish on the rotor itself. This is a watch that includes a full white gold double deployant clasp. JLC includes white gold clasps on its double deployant era watches that is post 2006 and this one is particularly comfortable with a curved underside that nicely matches the curved underside of your wrist. Throw it on the wrist, the watch with a 48 hour automatic winding power reserve, a true showpiece for Chagere Le chronometry capabilities. During the test of the caliber 978, that movement deviated as little on a daily basis as 0.17 seconds gained per day. That is the potential accuracy of this watch. Sticking with JLC for a moment, let's talk about another limited edition of 200. This one in white gold, launched in 2011. Likewise, this is the Duomet Accontium Lunaire in white gold, a timepiece that features a age of the moon and moon phase display alongside a calendar or a 31 day pointer date. It includes a one sixth of a second foudroyant and as you can note there are two power reserves because there are two independent barrels. With one crown you wind the two barrels. One of them ratchets while the other winds. You wind the two barrels in different directions. Why two barrels with a 50 hour power reserve for each? Well one of them does nothing but maintain balance amplitude and the other drives all the indications on the dial which means it drives the calendar, it drives the time, it drives the moon phase. This allows all of these indications to be driven while the watch keeps time without any loss of amplitude as you would normally see on a watch driving many independent sub dials. In other words, it's designed to keep chronometer grade time while suffering absolutely no loss of complexity and no loss of power reserve. That's why they don't simply drive all the complications off the barrel, which would maintain amplitude, but at the same time would reduce power reserve. You can see caliber 381 German silver bridges or nickel copper zinc with a sunray Cote de Soleil radiating out from an imaginary center point at the center of the balance. Beating away at 21,600 vibrations per hour, it is adjusted in six positions and free sprung. Screws are both black polished and fired blue. And you can see on the dial side, the watch includes a remarkable remarkable zero reset second system. Remember, chronometry is the goal here. So I have now stopped the second, see how the foudre stops at the index at zero, and then I zero reset the center seconds all the way to the top of the dial. Now I can set to a reference time with ease. Take note, the watch includes a handy pusher adjuster system for the date. So you can rapidly set the date correctly. The watch is easy to wear, 42 millimeters on the wrist and beautifully finished as it has an impressive presence. The dual wing movement essentially determining the size of the case, 42 millimeters and about 50 millimeters from lug to lug. It is a substantial dress watch. This is no shrinking violet. You don't necessarily want to be the anonymous guy wearing this watch because it will invite questions, the right kind of questions. Who makes it? What does that foudroyant do? What is the purpose of having dual dials? And of course, once you turn it over, the questions start anew. If anyone does ask about pricing, most likely they're going to overestimate the price of this timepiece. A very special case as well, as the lugs are black polished, and you can see that there's satin finish on the case band, but the lugs are stepped out. That's because this is welded assembly. Uh, the lugs are created separately. They're then welded on. Evidence of the joint where it abuts the case is removed, and then satin finish on the case and black polish on the lugs allows the watch to present a spectacular feat of external finishing by hand. This is a watch that's hand finished internally as well as externally. A truly special timepiece and one of my favorite from Chagere Le Coult. Let's go back to basics. That's an awful lot of mechanism and that's an awful lot of watch. Let's stick with something that is more elemental. Let's stick with the Vacheron Constantin Patrimony Automatic. A timepiece that in rose gold, slender, manufacturer powered, and as you can see with the same welded lug construction, offers the same level of handcraft, albeit with a little bit more discretion, easier clearance underneath a cuff. Uh, the timepiece at 40 millimeters, perfectly sized on my 16 centimeter circumference wrist. You'll note this is the ultimate dress watch. Not exceptionally broad across the wrist. I have plenty of clearance such that I can recommend this watch for wrists as small as 13 and a half centimeters circumference. You can see well under 10 millimeters thick and the watch powered by one of Vacheron's 2450 family of movements. You can see Geneva Hallmark, 
five position adjustment and a rose lathe cut or true guilloche cut 22 karat winding mass you'll note that the finishing of and I'll get a little bit closer so Harrison can show you the details here it does it does warrant them you can see the finishing of the movement is world class it is Geneva Hallmark but this watch of course is a timepiece of impeccable proportioning. And when you look at it in profile, you can see that the real beauty of this watch lies in its measured use of curves and creases. A truly superlative piece. You can see from the dial side, the combination of the black and the red gold, and it is 5N red gold, not pink, not rose, is show-stopping. Also important, you could see this is something most Patek Philippe autos of the same era could not do. Hacking seconds with a quick set date. All of the modern standards and applique rose gold indices, but look at the rose gold dimples on the dial for the minutes and seconds. A truly special piece, a simple rose gold Maltese cross pin buckle for quick adjustments on the wrist. That said, it is not my favorite Vacheron on the table today. That honor flows to this watch. This is the 47247, launched in 2002. The watch is 37 millimeters in platinum. Exquisite detail of the lug, so you can see they have a lovely Art Deco style fluting or ribbing profile on their edge, giving them that hard edged 1920s and 30s machine aesthetic. Though this watch is of the 21st century, its sensibility is rooted deeply in Vacheron's past history of extravagant and distinctive lug profiles. Now on the dial you can see it is a date 8. There is a day and there is a date. The date is a retrograde. You have white gold cabochon as well as radially rayed Roman numerals and the timepiece has a lovely herringbone motif to its matte black dial. Now there's also a brilliant complication as you can see, there is a adjuster system on the flank, so you can adjust the retrograde date without any resort to a pusher tool. And this is something every watch that relies on pusher adjusters should include. There is no reason why, for want of one-tenth of a gram of metal, you should be forced to carry around a pusher tool or disfigure your watch by using a pen. You can see the retrograde in action. There is a small pusher that is not a dimple, but rather a small button allowing you to adjust the system. On the reverse side, you have Vacheron improved caliber 11261. It's a JLC 889 modified by Vacheron, adjusted in a chronometer style five positions. You can see Cote de Genève across the rotor and bridges. You'll note that the watch features blued screws, fired blued screws, truly handsome and nice and slender. It allows this movement, in spite of the addition of the Vacheron manufacture complication, it allows this watch to be thin on the wrist. Throwing the watch on the wrist, you can see that there is no lower limit wrist size for wearing this one well. It's relatively compact across the wrist. You can see just how much space I have on both sides. Being platinum, it has an impressive weight, but I can recommend this watch as a unisex option because as narrow as it is across the wrist, and we're talking about 45 millimeters, anyone can wear this watch with real proportion and panache. A handsome and intense watch. The intensity comes from the combination of the whiter than white PT950 case with that black dial and strap. A truly special Vacheron piece and a watch that I happen to think is one of Vacheron's best ever. Released in 2002, the watch is 18 years young. Now let's talk a little bit about some affordable watches. I always like to pull in some watches from within the realm of reason. If you're saving up for your first luxury watch or you're looking for something that's a viable daily driver, maybe you own that Vacheron and you don't want to disfigure it in the daily rough and tumble, something like a 43.5 millimeter stainless steel Oris Aquas Date would be a perfect choice. This is a very impressive watch for the money, as it includes features you would expect at twice, even thrice the price. First, you have a ceramic bezel insert for the diving bezel. Let's hear the ratchet against my mic. Sharp, distinct, and precise. With a ceramic insert rather than the customary anodized aluminum at this price, you're already ahead of the game. Now take a look at the lug profiles themselves. They are held in place, the bars that is, that retain the bracelet or the strap, they are held in place by screws. So with screws and bars, no spring bars here, you have an extra measure of security against droppage. Also note, the crown guard structure is held on using screws, so each side can be independently replaced should it be gouged. Continuing on to the 
bracelet, one of my favorite features here is, despite the price point, and we're talking well under $3,000 even new, the removable links are fixed by screws, not by pin sleeves. And as you can see, the bracelet with a proprietary lug junction is fully integrated into the case. When this watch came out roughly seven years ago, this integrated bracelet lug profile was not yet in vogue. Oris was anticipating the trend. Take another look at the dial. Rather than the printed dial you would expect on a watch of this price point, you have all applique diamond polished and rhodium plated steel indices. Continuing down, we have, instead of a traditional entry level clamshell locking mechanism, twin triggers. And whereas ordinarily you wouldn't expect a dive extension at this price point, Oris provides one. And it's fully milled out from solid components, meaning it is very crisp, very precise, and very confidence inspiring. I'm gonna throw the watch on the wrist. The real strength of the 43.5 millimeter Aquas date is that it includes a relatively compact lug to lug span. So although this is almost a 44, it wears more like a 40, as it's identically broad across across the wrist as a solid end link six digit Rolex Submariner. And as you can see, it's under 14 millimeters thick, which makes it nice and slender and able to cope with a cuff. You can wear it under a jacket sleeve, sure, but you can also wear it under a dress sleeve. And that's where this watch really comes out ahead compared to the competition. 300 meters water resistant. It is a timepiece that offers an immense amount of value. But then again, so does the 42 millimeter stainless steel Longines Legend Diver. Longines launched the Legend Diver back in 2007 and was way ahead of the curve of vintage reissues. They essentially helped to create the genre. Now the watch based on the 1960s Longines, I want to say 7594 and 7150 models. If you Google those, you'll come up with something looking very much like this. They used the Irvin Picares super compressor cases that you also saw, for example, on IWC, Volcanes Cricket, uh, two models from Giger Le Coult, of which the Polaris was the more famous. So this case design is redolent to the 60s, but at 42 millimeters, this watch wears modern on the wrist. You can see that the timepiece features the same internal rotating bi-directional diving bezel that the original would have included, and you can use that as a handy reference point for timing. Line up the index with the minute hand, and now you have an impromptu count up zero to 60 minute timer, which I happen to prefer to a chronograph. Automatic winding, 40 hour power reserve, the timepiece. Impressively water resistant for a vintage inspired watch down to 300 meters rather than the standard 100 to 200 in the class. You could see how broad and strong across the wrist the lugs help to define the character of this watch. Full sized, imposing, anything but a dainty vintage watch, it still possesses a lot of power thanks to both its dimensioning and its proportioning. And speaking of proportioning, the watch is broad and flat and you can really see that on my wrist. This is a timepiece that rides low and because the generous dome profile of the box section crystal. You can see how the watch will easily slide underneath a cuff. I'll also mention that Longines sweated the details. As you can see, the quadrant style or quadrille sectioning of the crowns themselves, this sort of cross-hatched pattern that you would have seen on the original 7150 back in the mid-1960s. Not much to see on the reverse side. True to history, you have the image of the, the diver with the flippers and the spear. It's impressive, it's macho, it's butch, but then again, only you will see it because it's going to be on the underside of the watch on your wrist. A special piece, it includes a lovely strap that has a combination of a contrasting stitch and on the underside you can see a a natural calfskin leather for souplesse against the wrist. It even includes a vintage style pin buckle that is true to history. So again, sweating the details, everything about this watch comes together to make it very special indeed. Sticking with our theme of accessible watches, I think it's important to talk about a watch that blends the best of past and present. Now the Longines Legend and the Oris Aquas Date are impressive externally and impressive in specification, but they're not about the movement, whereas Tudor's in-house Black Bay divers are definitely about the movement. Now, this one uses the MT5602 70-hour power reserve, bi-directional winding, stop seconds, COSC chronometer, a full balance bridge, and a free spring index like a Rolex movement for shock resistance, and a silicon hairspring for anti-magnetism that's still rare on Rolex watches. 41 millimeters in steel. This watch is known as the Black Bay Red, and as you can see, it, the reason is obvious. Anodized aluminum insert here, rose gold plated indices and hands. Note the Tudor 
snowflake Submariner style hands, and then a different era of Tudor being referenced by the profile with a no guard big crown look. So you've got the early 60s and 1950s in profile, and then on the dial, chapter ring aside, you have more of a late 60s to mid 70s look. Let's hear the bezel against my mic. Chunkier than a Rolex bezel. Still precise, but this one with 120 clicks and a sharp ratchet has a character that's a bit more raw. Now the watch is 50 millimeters lug to lug and 22 millimeters between the lugs, so this is a large timepiece. This is not a small watch, and though a 41, I'd recommend you consider it more like a 42 or a 43 on the wrist. 14.8 millimeters thick. I think these Tudors get a bum rap for being thick watches, and while they are thick compared to Rolex, for example, they're not thick compared to their competitors at Omega, especially the Planet Oceans, which range from thick to outrageously thick. This watch will fit underneath the jacket cuff. One feature that I really like about these is that the anodized stem sleeve, you can see that there is a stem tube adjacent to the, the case. It's anodized the same color as the bezel itself, so nicely color coordinated. Tudor Rose logo on the crown and a Tudor Shield logo, the subsequent and current Tudor logo on the dial. So you have the later on the dial, you have the original Tudor Rose logo on the crown. You have this rivet style bracelet, and you can see that it looks like it's riveted, just like the Tudor Rolex bracelets of the 50s and early 60s would have been. But then you can also tell when you get really close to it that it's built like a modern bracelet and sized using screws. No pin sleeves, no rivets here. 200 meter water resistance, so while it's not quite as hardcore as the Longines Legend, it's still very viable as a dive watch. Now let's talk a little bit about Patek Philippe sports watches, and I've got a great one right here. I think this is the watch that really brought the Aquanaut line into its own. Back in 2011, the Aquanaut was still sort of living in the shadow of the Nautilus. It was known as the Baby, or the Little Brother Nautilus. It was known as the lesser or entry-level sports watch. And with the arrival of the 5164A, the Nautilus travel, or the Aquanaut travel time, all that changed. The Aquanaut travel time, first of all, compromises nothing of the original's aesthetics, as there's basically a symmetry in the wing profile from side to side, only on the nine o'clock side, you have the adjuster mechanism for the travel time function. It's built in, so you can adjust forward or backwards, and if you don't need two times on one dial, two time zones can be covered up to become one time zone. And then you have the day, and night indications for both local and reference time, an unusual refinement on a travel time watch. White gold hands, white gold applique, Arabic numerals. You can see this watch has a very special dial, which is a sort of gradient fade from silver black at its center to truly black at its edge. I would say it fades from slate to black. There's a date down at six o'clock. It's driven using the travel time function. You've got the full composite rubber strap with the quadrant style geosphere cut that you see on the dial itself and then on the case back you have a caliber 324 base 324 and it's driving the travel time complication it beats away at four hertz free sprung silicon hairspring six position adjustment guaranteed accurate to minus three plus two seconds per day from the factory and you can see this is otagam finishing high horology finish the 324 is a veteran it's no longer among the most sophisticated automatics on the market though it remains thin fine precise and beautifully made and all of those are ageless qualities of any watch the watch 40.8 millimeters in stainless steel an unusual size but nice and flat as it measures under 11 millimeters thick and it really hunkers down on the wrist. Still 120 meters water resistant in spite of the pushers associated with the complication. The watch is wearable and swimmable even at depth. And I can attest to the water resistance and loom quality as I have experienced the watch in its natural habitat. Now let's talk a little bit real quick about Rolex, because it's really not a show without some Rolex content. I respect Rolex immensely, and although I love individual models, the company as a whole is one that I venerate rather than adore. Now you can see here a model that launched in 2016, and I knew they were on to something. The second I saw the combination of the 40 millimeter stainless steel case with the ceramic bezel and either the black or the white dial, I realized we were quite a few years away from the Daytona craze dying down. I never imagined that people people would pay twice list for these. This watch 
looked good at Basel World 2016, it became a phenomenon, and even I didn't see that coming. I was there at the birth of this model, and I had no idea the juggernaut I was witnessing. Now, the watch remains appealing. Stainless steel, 40 millimeters, 12.2 millimeters thick, nice and low on the wrist. It's about 50.3 millimeters end link to end link across the wrist, which is to say it wears better on a small wrist than most of the super case GMT, Explorer 2, Sea Dweller, or Subs. The timepiece is not a super case, and in fact, its actual lug to lug dimension without the bracelet is 46.5 millimeters. So this one wears compact and snug. You'll also appreciate the fact that with the ceramic bezel, you get a lovely tonal contrast between the white lacquer dial and the bezel itself. There are really three primary tones here, silver, white, and black, with that lovely flash of Daytona red. Now the movement inside this 100 meter water resistant case, let's see if I've wound this one enough, but it is the Rolex manufactured caliber 4130. It was the first Rolex movement to include a winding bearing rather than a jeweled staff, which combines with the full balance bridge and the free spring index to make this a very impact tolerant watch. 72 hour power reserve and both a vertical clutch and a column wheel. You can hear how crisp this column wheel is. This is a watch that feels as good as anything in the business, including Longa's caliber 951 series in the 1815 and the Datagraph. This is a timepiece that gives you everything, precision, durability, history, heritage, and a brand that will be around forever to service it. Plus, Rolex guarantees these watches for five years, so almost all of them pre-owned or under warranty. And, critically, Rolex guarantees accuracy, minus two plus two seconds a day or better. That is something that no chronometer straight out of the COSC test can assure. Remember, COSC over 24 hours is no worse than minus four plus six seconds of total deviation. Rolex blows that away in percentage terms. Now, back in 2014, Rolex gave collectors what they'd been asking for, but not quite in the form expected. The Pepsi Bezel GMT went away with the five-digit reference, and it returned for the six-digit 116719, and I know you Rolex boffins already know what that nine at the end of the reference means. This is a white gold watch, and I don't think most folks accepted that the first ceramic bezel GMT Pepsi was going to be white gold. It was a bit of a stunner at the time because the watch was as rarefied as it was desirable. A megabuck acquisition and one that has begun to seem more logical with time as these watches were sparsely made and sparsely purchased, meaning the total population is low. And when you're looking for a future collectible Rolex, not necessarily an investment, but one with some upside potential and definite collector interest, you want to look for something that comes from one of the core model lines and the GMT is that plus is rare and in white gold and priced at almost $40,000 when new, this watch is that. Bidirectional rotating GMT bezel with insert of ceramic, both blue and red with a lovely pastel tone that recalls the original Bakelite bezel 6542 as famously worn by Pussy Galore in Goldfinger, if you recall that movie. Bond had a big crown sub and well, perhaps the most interesting Rolex was on his pilot's wrist, as the timepiece ultimately became a little bit of a film icon in addition to an aviator standby. Originally designed for Pan Am pilots and launched in late 1954, the watch was initially a single time zone watch with a 24 hour hand and a 12 hour hand, and using the bezel you could calculate a third time zone temporarily. Well, with the arrival of the GMT Master II in 1983, you could calculate three time zones, with the 24 hour and 12 hand being set separately and independently, but with the bezel, you gain that ability to offset using your local GMT port or airport of entry offset, and that gives you the third time zone. It's a flat watch at about 12.6 millimeters thick and 100 meters water resistant, plenty of loom, white gold hands, white gold indices, and a black lacquer dial. It has a lot of mass to it. I'm not going to lie. If you don't like a heavy and substantial luxury watch, this is not for you. If you love to feel that premium pull, the sense of substance above and beyond, that's exactly what this offers. And I would even say with its milled clasp, solid end links, and solid center links, plus the solid white gold case back. Rolex's white gold full bracelet watch feels like most other brands platinum full bracelet watch. We're not done just yet. We're not done with the bracelet either, although at first glance 
the 116655 Yachtmaster Oyster Flex does appear to be a Rolex Yachtmaster, 40 millimeters in rose gold on a strap, but the Oyster Flex is not that. A combination of a rubber coating on the outside with a titanium alloy on the inside, it is a full metal band all the way around, which is why Oyster Flex is referred to as a bracelet by Rolex. Now you can see it is properly named Oyster Flex. I'm not sure if you can read that on the flank, but it is a wonderfully engineered thing that feels great and looks even better. As you can see, it has the integration into the case flank that leaves no daylight between case and strap. And then there is a definition line down the spine of the strap that gives it the look of an integrated bracelet. Now in profile, you can see there are bellows underneath that help to cinch it down to the wrist, but also lift it above the wrist to ventilate the wrist on a hot day. You want a little bit of relief from heat, sweat, moisture, grit, and that's what the bellows system helps to give you. Now you can see the watch includes a full milled out rose gold clasp of exceptional substance. The days of the Rolex strap watches and stamped clasps are over. 48 hour power reserve, caliber 3135. It's mechanically identical to a sub, although it's lower on the wrist. A sub's gonna be about 12.8 millimeters thick. This is about 12.4. You can see it uses a matte black ceramic cerachrome insert inside a full rose gold bezel. So this is a very special watch. It looks good, it feels good. It wears unlike anything else in the Rolex catalog. And if I could point out possibly my favorite feature and refinement of this watch, it's when you look at the bezel, you could see that the numerals and the indices are raised, relieved, and polished, and the base of the bezel is of a matte finish, and the contrast in person is exquisite. It shows you the attention that Rolex stylists pay to the final product that reaches your wrist. I'll also mention that the dial itself, being a matte black, has almost a vintage look, whereas almost every other Rolex black dial is lacquer and glossy. This one is matte with a lovely red Yachtmaster script. The combination, again, giving it very much the feel of a 1960s or 70s Rolex Red Sub or Red Sea Dweller. A really cool watch and one of the more distinctively different Rolex models. Let's see, we've done just about all the cool stuff, or have we? Because I've got something here that is guaranteed to peg the meter. A watch that is by no means rare or expensive, but at the same time almost universally loved because it hit like a supernova in 2013. The Omega Speedmaster Moon Watch Dark Side of the Moon, 4.25 millimeters. The watch is entirely black ceramic, but it goes one step further with a black ceramic dial to match the case and the tachymeter bezel. This is a timepiece that's almost completely scratch proof while wearing feather light on the wrist. Note the attention to detail here, not just in design, but in engineering. As Omega gives you a full black pin and buckle, as scratch resistant as the case, this is where you normally see some sort of blackened metal on most ceramic watches. Omega giving you the same degree of resilience, that is not easy to do. The might of Swatch Group and its material science division. On the wrist, the zirconium oxide wears feather light, hypoallergenic, and as you can see at 50 millimeters lug to lug narrow across the wrist. It's an easy watch to wear, though it is thick. As you can see, this one has a little bit of a towering profile. It's not so thick that I wouldn't say you can fit it you couldn't fit it underneath a dress cuff, but I would say because of the cantilever of the bezel, you can see it flares upward and outward. It's probably not that watch to wear under formal attire dress sleeves, but it will fit underneath a jacket sleeve. Now there's a lot to love here. The hands and the indices, not always a given on Omega watches, only present on flagship models, but they are made of white gold to resist oxidation and tarnish over time. You have the ability to set the hour hand independently while the watch still keeps time, and you'll note that you can actually travel east or west, and if the date does change in the process, you can set it forward or backward. There is a mono counter at three o'clock, which features both chronograph hours and minutes, giving the entirety of the dial a clean bi-register, bilaterally symmetrical, vintage-inspired look. Turn it all over, and you get caliber 9300, twin barrels, 65-hour power reserve, a COSC chronometer, and a coaxial escapement, the coax, for greater short-term timing stability, long-term timing precision and reduced maintenance requirements. There's also a vertical clutch and a column wheel, and you can actually see the column wheel underneath its skeletonized bridge peeking out. Twin mainspring barrels helping to avoid the loss of amplitude after 
24 or 48 hours. A lot of times single barrel movements like the Rolex 3135 or even the Daytona 4130 will have issues of amplitude loss after 24 hours, not with the twin barrel arrangement. And then you have the distinctive arabesque Cote de Genève and the blackened rather than blued or polished screw heads. A really special watch and one of the greats of the 2010s. As we reflect more and more on that era, we begin to appreciate the real trailblazers of the period. Uh, watches like the original PAM 382 Bronzo, the dark side of the moon, the pace setters from that period, and the ones that will be best remembered in the future. Speaking of the Bronzo, the olive green dial for many was just as great a highlight as the bronze case. It was the two together that made the watch. And this is the Panerai Rodimir 1940 GMT PAM 999. 1,000 pieces for 2019. It features rose gold hands and indices and an e-crew Super Luminova dial with a little bit of a Fotina look, but all done in good taste as you have a combination of colors, the rose coloration, the green, the silver of the case, and the brown of the strap. Now I want to show you some of the functions and features here because this is one of the most complicated non-tourbillon Panerai watches you can buy. 100 meters water resistant with a screw down crown. What we have here, take a look at the second hand, is a zero reset system like we saw on the Duomet. Pull the crown, it zeroes the second hand. There's an AM PM on that dial coaxial with the second hand. So you have a mono counter with constant seconds and AM PM at nine. You have a second time zone or a rose gold index. You have the ability to set everything in sync with the movement hacked and the second hand zeroed or you can go into local time setting mode with the crown in its intermediate position and now you can do exactly as we just did with the dark side of the moon including driving the date in either direction 72 hour automatic winding power reserve with a power reserve indicator the watch is 45 millimeters in stainless steel and it's powered by perhaps Panerai's most interesting mainstream movement the three day power reserve full bridge free sprung micro rotor caliber 4002 it's a handsome nicely executed thin profiled automatic that gives you the big open vista of a manual wind but with the convenience of an automatic and also the slender profile of a manual wind. You can see that lovely vintage inspired bubble like sapphire. It's designed to evoke vintage plexiglass but with the scratch resistance of modern sapphire. Throw it on the wrist and though it's a 45. Panerai watches wear differently. This doesn't wear like a 45. It wears more like a 42 or a 43. It's comfortable. It's thin for a Panerai and as you can see because of the ramp up of the case flank it does fit easily underneath most cuffs. Not the tightest of dress sleeves or exotics like French cuffs. But if you wear a suit to the office, this watch is not going to be an encumbrance of any kind. And fully swimmable, you need only throw it on a water-resistant Panerai or aftermarket rubber band to make this a fully aquatic timepiece. This is about as good as Panerai gets, and I would say that's the kind of watch for those who are not necessarily into Panerai. Guys who are about dress watches, guys who are about complications, guys who are all about the movement in the watch, that manufacturer movement Panerai gives you all of these things. Now let's speak for a moment about a brand that I absolutely love. I talked about revering and respecting Rolex. I love Alanga Unzona. And this is a watch that I recently featured, but I got a couple of requests to show it again. So I know some of you guys must be shopping this watch. Here is the second generation 1815 chronograph. White gold, sterling silver dial, 39.5 millimeters, and much thinner than a datagraph. Now the watch includes a caliber 951 series. I believe it's the 9516 that increases the power reserve of the standard third and original 951, which was 36 hours. It increases the power reserve to 60 hours. As with the datagraph, it is a flyback chronograph. So it resets and restarts. And I probably need to wind this one a little bit more because it is a manual wind watch and it likes to be wound. But there you go. You can see how the flyback system allows you to reset and restart. It doesn't have a date. It doesn't have a power reserve. It is a very clean and balanced dial. And the watch is more slender because of it. Now you can see that extraordinary Olympian caliber on the case back. One of Longa's finest. When this movement debuted in the datagraph back in 1999, it caused some real soul searching back in Geneva at Patek and Vacheron. All of a sudden, they had catch up to do and you could see it's as appealing today as it was then column wheel lateral clutch free sprung swan's neck black polished fine adjustment mechanism overcoil hairspring adjusted in five positions golden nickel copper zinc german silver bridges and plates silvered stainless steel chronograph yoke levers horns and recentering hammer you could see both black 
polished and fire blued screws, and you can see a few well chosen pivot jewels set in screw fixed golden chaton. In other words, this is the patrimony of Saxony. This is the modern heritage of German wristwatch manufacture, and this is the style that Langa alone established in the 90s. All other, from Nomos to Glasuta Original, adopted it. This is not inevitable. This was drawn from the pocket watch era, but Lanka created this look in the wristwatch era. Throw it on the wrist, it's comfy, it's compact, it's not broad across the wrist at about 47 millimeters. And you can see that the watch 39.5 is just about perfectly sized. A handsome watch, a watch that could look good on any wrist with the combination of the white dial and the white case. It could be sports casual, it could be formal, ready to dress up or down. It is more slender than a datagraph and cuffs that'll hang up on the dado will glide right over the 1815. My favorite detail of the watch, other than the movement of course, it's these beautiful fire blued steel alpha hands. So much lighter and crisper than the thick triangular dauphine hands. These are pinched and arrowhead like. You can see that they do have a greater grace opening up the center of the dial. They have a lightness. They have a sharpness to them. They're almost poetry in slow motion. Ah, oh, Patek Philippe, you rarely disappoint me. I'm not interested in your hyped models. I have no need for a Nautilus in my collection, nor am I necessarily intrigued by the brand's stainless steel offerings in general. But you give me a precious metal Patek Philippe complication, and I am smitten. This is the 5231J, 38.5 millimeters in yellow gold. The watch is less than 11 millimeters thick. And as you can see, it features a sharp angular case that is more crisply defined than the previous 5130 and 5131. The lugs are dramatically stepped out from the case band. The bezel is conical and sheer. You can see that the lug profiles themselves have their own individual chiseled sculpt sculptural beauty missing on the integrated lugs of its predecessor. The case band in high polish, explosive against even soft lighting. And you'll note as we move over to the crown side, beautifully unadorned with the bezel, the case band, the crown, and the lugs each standing out as a separate artisanal act of virtuosity and absolute commitment and conviction by the designers. A uh, combination of curves and creases beautifully blended. Now the dial is cloisonné enamel and as you can see it features an enamel set of continents and seas bounded by wires of gold and fired up to 20 times. It's built on a gold dial base and in fact I can index the system and show you how it works. As the reference city changes in sync with the hour, I start with my current city, and as I travel, I simply transfer my current city to the index up at 12 o'clock, and the watch does all the math. As you can see, there is a 24-hour counterclockwise rotating day-night ring showing you where it's day and night so you can count the time zones in all 24 or the time in all 24 the world's principal time zones each represented by a signature city caliber 240 micro rotor this is the caliber 240 hu and everything i said of the panerai micro rotor goes double for this one finish precision history heritage execution and attention to detail plus the sheer thinness of a micro rotor and the vast open and visible splendor that you get with a micro rotor, just like a manual wind, but with the convenience of automatic winding, a 48 hour power reserve. Now we draw near our conclusion, two very special watches from Patek Philippe, two watches that had to end this episode. My two favorite Patek Philippe watches of the last 10 years, in my right hand, the Patek Philippe 5235G regulator, vertical satin finished dial, regulator, hour, minute, and seconds on separate dials, hacking seconds, micro rotor automatic, a chiseled case inspired by the historic 3448 perpetual calendar. It is an annual calendar with the Patek Philippe logo engraved on the dial and all blue accents for the printing and the graphics as well as the day, month, and date discs. Turn it over and you can see that the watch features a unique caliber 31260 REG. It is the 240 highly modified with all of the advanced research silicon components except the silicon gold balance. So you have the hairspring, you have the escape wheel, and you have the lever, increasing the power reserve compared to the standard watch to over 50 hours compared to the 48 of the standard 240. It also has a unique and distinctive beat rate of 
23,075 beats per hour. It increases the precision as well. Micro rotor automatic as ever. And note the finger style bridges for the train in the fashion of original Geneva pocket watch architecture. You can also see that the movement is bigger in diameter than the standard 240 to better fill the case back. Throw it on the wrist. This watch takes my breath away. It will be the first Patek Philippe I ever own. Low, flat, handsome, and powerful. It's a vintage aesthetic, again, the 3448, which entered production in the early 60s. Right down to the details, Patek Philippe fitting this watch with a vintage logo on its white gold spade style pin buckle. No detail overlooked. Terry Stern's finest work as the design head honcho at Patek. Now in 2017, and only for 2017, Patek gave us what I believe to be its most interesting steel watch of the last decade. This is the 5961A010, also known as the ebony dial. Larger indices and hands fully loomed. This is a sporting style, full bracelet, 40.5 millimeter, stainless steel, flyback chronograph, annual calendar power reserve, and note the excellence of the detailing, such as the black discs for the day, the date, and the month on the black matte dial. Now the watch features a flyback chronograph. You reset and restart with a single push of the trigger. Note the power reserve for the 55 hour reserve de marche. The timepiece with a vertical clutch, a column wheel, free sprung gyromax style balance. And when I throw it on the wrist, it is slender, it is graceful, it arcs and hugs. I, I would even say embraces my wrist. A perfect fit and a perfect feel with caliber 28520 inside, Patek Philippe's first ever automatic chronograph caliber released in 2006 on the original 5960. This is the 5961A010, a one year stainless steel full bracelet Patek Philippe complication. I have nothing on this table that can top that. I am exhausted, guys. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure waking up with you this weekend. Have a great one. Remember, T Mosso at thewatchbox.com, your purchase and pricing email line. Questions about anything you see here or on this channel or on my Instagram. Timeout, Tim out, and thank you for logging on.